Welcome to Case Flash, brought to you by the CBA Family Law Section. I'm Sam Schoonmaker, and with me are Judge Elaine Gordon and Attorney Alan Palmer. This Case Flash examines United States v. Windsor and the U.S. Supreme Court's determination that the definition of marriage in DOMA was unconstitutional. It focuses on practical implications of this ruling on Connecticut family law. First, the basic facts. After the death of her same-sex spouse, Windsor sought to claim the estate tax exemption for a surviving spouse. She was barred from doing so by Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, which excluded a same-sex partner from the definition of spouse. She paid the $363,000 tax, but filed suit in federal district court seeking a refund. She challenged the definition of marriage in DOMA as unconstitutional. The District Court and the Court of Appeals determined that the provision was unconstitutional and ordered the United States to pay Windsor a refund. The U.S. Supreme Court affirmed in a 5-4 to four decision. Uh, Attorney Palmer, what's the, uh, the state's rights examination that underlies the majority decision? The, uh, the historical right that was uh, written about by Justice Kennedy was that historically the states defined what marriage was within their states. Uh, in this case, uh, 11 of the 50 states have determined that same-sex marriages were entitled to the same privileges as heterosexual marriages, and that's the right that's being championed here. Um, this is a really brief opinion, I think, for given the, uh, the, the questions that had been brought before the Supreme Court. What the Supreme Court basically did is it looked at the states that had enacted uh, uh, laws uh, allowing for gay marriage, and it talked about the historical deference to states um, uh, for, their mar for their marriage laws and laws regarding that. And then it basically said that um, DOMA had been passed essentially to in disregard of the usual respect for those laws and with the sole purpose to demean the equal dignity of the people who were being allowed to marry under those laws. And that the uh, purpose being to demean the equal dignity of those people uh, the law was therefore unconstitutional as a denial of due process under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. And a, a, a Fifth Amendment argument usually requires some kind of um, a, a liberty interest, uh, usually a liberty interest underlying the, ar the, uh, the argument. What was a liberty interest here? Here, uh, Justice Kennedy determined that the state of New York uh, defined uh, same-sex spouses as a protected class uh, entitled to the privileges of marriage. Uh, so Justice Kennedy, in his opinion, uh, says it's the Fifth Amendment's obligation to protect that class of people, even though they're in, in the distinct minority of the population. It's our obligation to protect those people. That sounds like an equal protection yes, argument. Yes, doesn't it? <laughs> it's an interesting uh, art, uh, argument, which is touched upon with some uh, interesting comment by Justice Scalia in his dissent. Um, what the opinion says um, is that the liberty protected by the Fifth Amendment's due process clause contains within it the prohibition against denying to any person the equal protection of the laws. So therefore, the Fifth Amendment protects <laughs> you protects the liberty to have equal protection of the laws. And I don't think anybody ever heard that phrase before. And then they have an interesting statement that says that while the Fifth Amendment itself withdraws from government the power to degrade or demean in the way this law does, the equal protection guarantee of the Fourteenth Amendment makes the, that Fifth Amendment right all the more specific and all the better understood and preserved. So they're not doing a 14th Amendment equal protection analysis, but they're almost incorporating all the principles of equal protection now into the Fifth Amendment. And um, I think you have an equal, I think you have a right to a liberty, your, the liberty interest is to, in some sense, equal dignity under the laws uh, that have been provided by your state on matters that are preserved to the state, which still sounds like an equal protection argument. Yeah. And prior, prior to this decision, though, had any of us even heard of the equal right to dignity? 
No, and I think that what the court has done is avoided the entire equal protection, which level of scrutiny, you know, problem, uh, and having to deal with all that by now making this equal, this right, a due process right under the Fifth Amendment. All the rest of those, you know, as, as you pointed out, Alan, when we were discussing this earlier, this is kind of backwards. We normally see the um, Fifth Amendment being applied through the Fourteenth, and, and we're now taking the Fourteenth and applying it back through the Fifth, so it's kind of interesting. This is kind of an amalgamation of the Fifth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, equal protection, and federalism, right? right. All mixed together. Right. And without the kind of um, the uh, usual analysis you might see, like a strict scrutiny, uh, intermediate level analysis, or a rational basis analysis that you would normally see in an equal protection case, uh, there's none of that discussion in the majority decision. Well, the, the white elephant in the room, I think, quite clearly is is what happens to a to to a citizen of New York or Connecticut or a, a state that uh, recognizes same-sex marriages and they move with their family to a state that doesn't recognize their marriage. I mean, we, we discussed how this would affect things as basic as, as showing up at your child's school and saying, I'm the father, when, when we may not have a biological, biological connection to the child. We don't know what's going to happen in those states. I think that's where the equal protection argument is really going to flesh itself out when that case winds its way to the Supreme Court. Well, if there's now a federally recognized through the Fifth Amendment right to this equal protection, does that now go back down through the Fourteenth Amendment to the states? Yeah, exactly. Is that the next step? That's the next step clearly for the litigation. I mean, all the news articles have been discussing the problems faced by people who marry in one state where it's legal, then wind up residing in another state where their marriage isn't recognized and lose their ability to, you know, get some of the, the state benefits that they would have had if they stayed where they where they lived. And both both uh, Justice Kennedy in the majority opinion and Justice Scalia in, in the, the larger of the dissents, you know, both comment extensively on the, on, and are emphatic that mm -hmm. this case doesn't deal with the issue of comedy or full faith and credit, which is the big, the white elephant in the room. And what's going to happen to these people now that we have a federally recognized uh, right uh, at least in, in 11 or 12 states in the country, and we have 38 states that don't recognize that right. You know, we're, if we're truly a mobile, transient society, eventually that case is going to have to be decided as well. Do we think we're going to see more of those cases in Connecticut? Since Connecticut is one of the 12 or 13 states where uh, there is a valid marriage, and therefore I would assume, you know, therefore it can be, that marriage can be dissolved in a Connecticut court if the court has jurisdiction over the marriage. So maybe we're going to be be seeing more divorces of gay marriages in Connecticut. Yeah, that's possible. I, I one of the things we discussed is what happens when the same-sex couple who's married in Connecticut and has a a valid marriage under Connecticut law moves to Nevada or Texas or Arkansas or someplace where they don't have same-sex marriages and tries to get divorced there. Their courts in that state don't have don't recognize the marriage, which is now being asked to dissolve. And I think at that point, there's a real legitimate equal protection claim because these people have to dissolve their marriage somehow. They shouldn't be required to go back to Connecticut where they were married in order to get divorced. I don't even know if Connecticut would enter jurisdiction on that basis. Well, not unless we shorten our jurisdictional period. Um, you know, you, you could, I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see if, you know, coupled with tourism or something, somebody might want to become the quickie divorce capital of the... Yeah. Uh, well, one of the 13 states, you know, length, you know, shortening up jurisdictional requirements. We have a year here, so. Yeah, plus proving domicile, intention right. to relieve the other domicile. So, yeah, that's, that, that, could be, that could be an issue we see a little bit more of. Attorney Palmer, there were three dissents here. Um, what did you find persuasive in the dissents? I, I, I can't believe I'm admitting this on the Internet. However, uh, uh, I... I I think Justice Scalia raises some very valid points as to whether or not this is even a case in controversy. Uh, here we have a plaintiff who won her claim and the government on appeal agreeing that she won her claim and should have won her claim. The only issue here should have been an action to enforce the order that was entered by the district court uh, for the payment of the, of the, of the uh, tax. 
and clearly I'm, I'm overjoyed at the result that the majority reached. But, but having said that, you know, I, I think that the, that the case was clearly result-driven. Clearly the justices in the majority, you know, see this uh, terribly unfair um, uh, treatment and want to correct it. But the analysis as in the, and I think the dissents do point out that both in terms of standing and in terms of the equal protection argument, that the I don't I, I don't not going to agree with Justice Scalia's Scalia's characterization that the opinion contains legalistic argle bargle, <laughs> another interesting legal term. Um, but there is a kind of confluence of due process and equal protection. And Scalia goes through this entire exercise of being able to take the exact same arguments that are applied to DOMA and now using it to apply um, to the ability to strike down the state laws that prohibit um, uh, gay marriage. And that's interesting, because um, uh, he sees that as the other shoe waiting to drop. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he talks about a lot of, in his dissent, as this kind of being the, the that will be the inevitable next step, and that the analysis a, is a setup for that next analysis. Yeah, I think also Chief Justice Roberts writes a, a very short but very persuasive um, dissent. Uh, he points out that as of 1996, when Delma was passed, all 50 states uh, had uh, defined marriage as being between one man and one woman, and that the entire world defined it that way. Uh, and that to attribute malice to the 85 senators, 342 mm -hmm. representatives, and President Clinton uh, for passing DOMA was unfair, uh, and there was no intent to harm. They were just trying to provide uniformity and stability in the in the federal law, uh, and it had nothing to do at that time with um, with dignity. It had to do, or maybe at least not for for uh, many of those uh, lawmakers who passed the. The, uh, the legislation. Uh, what are some of the practical implications? What are some of the new benefits that uh, a, a same-sex couple is going to benefit from? I, I think that, you know, I don't, I think unless you were in this situation, you wouldn't realize how far-reaching Kent Media, in his opinion, talks about the thousands of federal um, laws and regulations which might affect um, uh, couples whose uh, marriages had not been allowed to be recognized by DOMA. I mean, in family law, some of the most basic ones are the right to Social Security benefits, the right to Social Security survivor uh, benefits, the uh, right now to be able to have your health insurance and not be taxed on the benefit um, that's provided to um, to your spouse. There are implications um, probably in other ERISA kind of things. In this, the, the case that was brought shows what the implication is for estate planning and estate tax purposes and the spousal deduction and spousal exclusion. And um, there are, and then for military, and when you think about the military and you think that your entire, all your job benefits and everything that uh, go to your family um, are provided by the federal government, it's the right to the health insurance for your spouse, it's the right to a pension, it's the right to survivor benefits. As Justice Kennedy pointed out, it's the right to be buried next to your spouse in a military cemetery. Um, right so to a PX card. Right, the PX card. So I think these are really very practical day-to-day -day Things. And the other thing that I think that was very moving in his opinion, which I, you know, I think was a, a, a very heartwarming opinion and emotionally drafted, was the effect on children of, um, for the stability, which doesn't have anything to do with federal rights, but just the stability and dignity afforded to their family unit. I think some, some other issues uh, also include financial aid to students, uh, same-sex couples now can have a spouse on their applications for such things as Pell Grants and other financial aid uh, mechanisms. Section 8 housing, well that's not something I, I deal with on a, on a regular basis, that's certainly uh, a, a right that, that a spouse would be entitled to uh, under that statutory scheme. Uh, certain bankruptcy rights are now available to spouses because of federal recognition. Uh, Judge Gordon discussed ERISA, uh, but something as basic as COBRA benefits are now included for same-sex spouses. So this, this really has a far-reaching effect. 
How about in terms of a marital dissolution, the deductibility of alimony? Oh, we forgot. How can how, three three family mm -hmm. people up here and we forgot to talk about taxes and <laughs> alimony? Um, yes. Well, now people can file uh, in these marriages can file a joint return. Uh, which they were unable to do. They had to pay for the double preparation of being able to file a joint return for uh, Connecticut and um, a single, two single returns for the federal government. But um, in terms of divorce planning and financial planning uh, in a divorce, they have the ability to have alimony awards uh, recognized and deductible on their federal income taxes. Attorney Palmer, do you think that might affect some uh, divorces that have already gone to judgment? Depending on how uh, prior divorces between some same-sex couples were drafted, um, I can envision a situation where uh, spousal support uh, ends upon the death of the payee, which would technically qualify for deductibility under the uh, IRS regulations where uh, there was no real intent for that to happen under the decree because there was no alimony deduction. Um, but the language of the decree is going to control, and I can see uh, a former spouse taking a deduction he or she previously hadn't taken and then fighting this issue out with the IRS. Does, does this open the floodgates for re claims of retroactive application for such things as, as payment of taxes? Are we going to see now a floodgate of cases where people who previously couldn't claim a deduction are now going to ask for their money back? Are you saying amended returns, for, for example, and uh, what, where there's been uh, alimony paid? Or estate taxes paid, or or any sort of tax paid that, that there could have been some sort of special exemption for. What happens when the amended returns start coming in? Is this going to be applied retroactively or simply prospectively? I think that's going to be one of those items that the mm -hmm. uh, that the executive branch is going to have to sort out. Well, I wonder what would have happened if, when when the bipartisan le uh, legislative group filed their appearance, if instead of vigorously advocating against Ms. Windsor and the President's position if they simply said, you know what, we're going to withdraw the appeal so there's no appellate decision and we're not going to risk there being a, a, a case out there standing for this proposition. In you retrospect, think? that would have been the, the best decision, right? Uh, because then, they, well, then there would have been no one advocating, there would be no one arguing the other side of this case because the, the executive branch was on Mrs. Windsor's side. Exactly. Right, and the appellate court opinion would have stood, which was in her favor. She would have been forced to have gotten her money back, and it would have been the end of... Well, there would be no appellate decision right. striking down Doma. No Supreme Court decision. No Supreme Court decision striking down Doma. United States v. Windsor is a major decision, and the implications will re uh, resound in Connecticut for many years to come. Thank you for watching Case Flash.